Chapter 3 Law has it my father once wrestled a black bear in Baluchistan with his bare hands. If the story had been about anyone else, it would have been dismissed as laugh, that Afghan tendency to exaggerate, sadly almost a national affliction. If someone bragged that his son was a doctor, chances were the kid had once passed a biology test in high school. But no one ever doubted the veracity of any story about Bubba, and if they did, well, Bubba did have those three parallel scars coursing a jagged path down his back. I have imagined Bubba's wrestling match countless times, even dreamed about it. And in those dreams, I can never tell Bubba from the bear. It was Rahim Khan who first referred to him as what eventually became Bubba's famous nickname, Tupan Aga, or Mr. Hurricane. It was an apt enough nickname. My father was a force of nature, a towering Pashtun specimen with a thick beard, a wayward crop of curly brown hair as unruly as the man himself, hands that looked capable of uprooting a willow tree, and a black glare that would drop the devil to his knees begging for mercy, as Rahim Khan used to say. At parties, when all six foot five of him thundered into the room, attention shifted to him like sunflowers turning to the sun. Bubba was impossible to ignore, even in his sleep. I used to bury cotton wisps in my ears, pull the blanket over my head, and still the sounds of Bubba's snoring, so much like a growling truck engine, penetrated the walls. And my room was across the hall from Bubba's bedroom. How my mother ever managed to sleep in the same room as him is a mystery to me. It's on the long list of things I would have asked my mother if I had ever met her. In the late 1960s, when I was five or six, Baba decided to build an orphanage. I heard the story through Rahim Khan. He told me Baba had drawn the blueprints himself, despite the fact that he'd had no architectural experience at all. Skeptics had urged him to stop his foolishness and hire an architect. Of course, Baba refused, and everyone shook their heads in dismay at his obstinate ways. Then Baba succeeded and everyone shook their heads in awe at his triumphant ways. Baba paid for the construction of the two-story orphanage just off the main strip of Jada Mewand, south of the Kabul River, with his own money. Rahim Khan told me Baba had personally funded the entire project, paying for the engineers, electricians, plumbers and labourers, not to mention the city officials whose moustaches needed oiling. It took three years to build the orphanage. I was eight by then. I remember the day before the orphanage opened. Baba took me to Gagar Lake, a few miles north of Kabul. He asked me to fetch Hassan too, but I lied and told him Hassan had the runs. I wanted Baba all to myself. And besides, one time at Gagar Lake, Hassan and I were skimming stones, and Hassan made his stones skip eight times. The most I managed was five. Baba was there, watching, and he patted Hassan on the back, even put his arm around his shoulder. We sat at a picnic table on the banks of the lake, just Baba and me, eating boiled eggs with kofta sandwiches, meatballs and pickles wrapped in naan. The water was a deep blue, and sunlight glittered on its looking-glass clear surface. On Fridays, the lake was bustling with families out for a day in the sun. But it was midweek, and there was only Bubba and me, us and a couple of long-haired, bearded tourists, hippies, I'd heard them called. They were sitting on the dock, feet dangling in the water, fishing poles in hand. I asked Bubba why they grew their hair long, but Bubba grunted, didn't answer. He was preparing his speech for the next day, flipping through a havoc of handwritten pages, making notes here and there with a pencil. I bit into my egg and asked Bubba if it was true what a boy in school had told me, that if you ate a piece of eggshell, you'd have to pee it out. Bubba grunted again. I took a bite of my sandwich. One of the yellow-haired tourists laughed and slapped the other one on the back. In the distance, across the lake, a truck lumbered around a corner on the hill. Sunlight twinkled on its side-view mirror. I think I have saratan. I said. Cancer. 
Baba lifted his head from the pages flapping in the breeze, told me I could get the soda myself. All I had to do was look in the trunk of the car. Outside the orphanage the next day, they ran out of chairs. A lot of people had to stand to watch the opening ceremony. It was a windy day, and I sat behind Baba on the little podium just outside the main entrance of the new building. Baba was wearing a green suit and a caracool hat. Midway through the speech, the wind knocked his hat off, and everyone laughed. He motioned to me to hold his hat for him, and I was glad to, because then everyone would see that he was my father, my Baba. He turned back to the microphone and said he hoped the building was sturdier than his hat, and everyone laughed again. When Baba ended his speech, people stood up and cheered. They clapped for a long time. Afterward, people shook his hand. Some of them tousled my hair and shook my hand too. I was so proud of Baba, of us. But, despite Baba's successes, people were always doubting him. They told Baba that running a business wasn't in his blood, and he should study law like his father. So Baba proved them all wrong by not only running his own business, but becoming one of the richest merchants in Kabul. Baba and Rahim Khan built a wildly successful carpet exporting business, two pharmacies, and a restaurant. When people scoffed that Baba would never marry well, after all he was not of royal blood, he wedded my mother, Sophia Akrami, a highly educated woman universally regarded as one of Kabul's most respected, beautiful, and virtuous ladies. And not only did she teach classic Farsi literature at the university, she was a descendant of the royal family, a fact that my father playfully rubbed in the skeptics' faces by referring to her as my princess. With me as the glaring exception, my father moulded the world around him to his liking. The problem, of course, was that Baba saw the world in black and white, and he got to decide what was black and what was white. You can't love a person who lives that way without fearing him too maybe even hating him a little. When I was in fifth grade, we had a mullah who taught us about Islam. His name was Mullah Fatiullah Khan, a short, stubby man with a face full of acne scars and a gruff voice. He lectured us about the virtues of zakat and the duty of hajj. He taught us the intricacies of performing the five daily namaz prayers and made us memorize verses from the Quran. And though he never translated the words for us, he did stress, sometimes with the help of a stripped willow branch, that we had to pronounce the Arabic words correctly so God would hear us better. He told us one day that Islam considered drinking a terrible sin. Those who drank would answer for their sin on the day of Qiyamat, Judgment Day. In those days, drinking was very common in Kabul. No one gave you a public lashing for it. But those Afghans who did drink did so in private, out of respect. People bought their scotch as medicine in brown paper bags from selected pharmacies. They would leave with the bag tucked out of sight, sometimes drawing furtive, disapproving glances from those who knew about the store's reputation for such transactions. We were upstairs in Baba's study, the smoking room, when I told him what Mullah Fatiullah Khan had taught us in class. Baba was pouring himself a whiskey from the bar he had built in the corner of the room. He listened, nodded, took a sip from his drink. Then he lowered himself into the leather sofa, put down his drink, and propped me up on his lap. I felt as if I was sitting on a pair of tree trunks. He took a deep breath and exhaled through his nose, the air hissing through his moustache for what seemed an eternity. I couldn't decide whether I wanted to hug him or leap from his lap in mortal fear. I see you have confused what you're learning in school with actual education, he said in his thick voice. But if what he said is true, then does it make you a sinner, Baba? Hmm. Baba crushed an ice cube between his teeth. Do you want to know what your father thinks about sin? Yes. Then I'll tell you, Baba said. But first, understand this. And understand it now, Amir. 
You'll never learn anything of value from those bearded idiots. You mean Mullah Fatullah Khan? Baba gestured with his glass. The eyes clinked. I mean all of them. Piss on the beards of all those self-righteous monkeys. I began to giggle. The image of Baba pissing on the beard of any monkey, self-righteous or otherwise, was too much. They do nothing but thumb their prayer beads and recite a book written in a tongue they don't even understand. He took a sip. God help us all if Afghanistan ever falls into their hands. But Mullah Fatiullah Khan seems nice, I managed between bursts of tittering. So did Genghis Khan, Baba said. But enough about that. You asked about sin, and I want to tell you. Are you listening? Yes, I said, pressing my lips together. But a chortle escaped through my nose and made a snorting sound. That got me giggling again. Bubba's stony eyes bore into mine, and just like that I wasn't laughing any more. I mean to speak to you man to man. Do you think you can handle that for once? Yes, Baba Jan, I muttered. Marvelling not for the first time at how badly Bubba could sting me with so few words, we had had a fleeting good moment. It wasn't often Bubba talked to me, let alone on his lap, and I'd been a fool to waste it. Good, Bubba said, but his eyes wandered. Now, no matter what the Mullah teaches, there is only one sin, only one, and that is theft. Every other sin is a variation of theft. Do you understand that? No, Baba Jan, I said, desperately wishing I did. I didn't want to disappoint him again. Baba heaved a sigh of impatience. That stung too, because he was not an impatient man. I remembered all the times he didn't come home until after dark, all the times I ate dinner alone. I'd ask Ali where Baba was when he was coming home. Though I knew full well he was at the construction site, overlooking this, supervising that, didn't that take patience? I already hated all the kids he was building the orphanage for. Sometimes I wished they'd all died along with their parents. When you kill a man, you steal a life, Papa said. You steal his wife's right to a husband, rob his children of a father. When you tell a lie. You steal someone's right to the truth. When you cheat, you steal the right to fairness. Do you see? I did. When Baba was six, a thief walked into my grandfather's house in the middle of the night. My grandfather, a respected judge, confronted him, but the thief stabbed him in the throat, killing him instantly and robbing Baba of a father. The townspeople caught the killer just before noon the next day. He turned out to be a wanderer from the Kunduz region. They hanged him from the branch of an oak tree, with still two hours to go before afternoon prayer. It was Rahim Khan, not Baba, who had told me that story. I was always learning things about Baba from other people. There is no act more wretched than stealing, Amir, Baba said. A man who takes what's not his to take, be it a life or a loaf of naan, I spit on such a man. And if I ever cross paths with him, God help him. Do you understand? I found the idea of Baba clobbering a thief both exhilarating and terribly frightening. Yes, Baba. If there's a God out there, then I would hope he has more important things to attend to than my drinking scotch or eating pork. Now, hop down. All this talk about sin has made me thirsty again. I watched him fill his glass at the bar, and wondered how much time would pass before we talked again the way we just had. Because the truth of it was, I always felt like Baba hated me a little. And why not? After all, I had killed his beloved wife, his beautiful princess, hadn't I? The least I could have done was to have had the decency to have turned out a little more like him. But I hadn't turned out like him, not at all. In school, we used to play a game called Shirjanji or Battle of the Poems. The Farsi teacher moderated it, and it went something like this: 
You recited a verse from a poem, and your opponent had sixty seconds to reply with a verse that began with the same letter that ended yours. Everyone in my class wanted me on their team, because by the time I was eleven, I could recite dozens of verses from Kayam, Hafez, or Rumi's famous Masnawi. One time, I took on the whole class and won. I told Baba about it later that night, but he just nodded, muttered, "Good." That was how I escaped my father's aloofness, in my dead mother's books. That and Hassan, of course. I read everything: Rumi, Hafez, Sadi, Victor Hugo, Jules Verne, Mark Twain, Ian Fleming. When I had finished my mother's books, not the boring history ones. I was never much into those, but the novels, the epics. I started spending my allowance on books. I bought one a week from the bookstore near Cinema Park and stored them in cardboard boxes when I ran out of shelf room. Of course, marrying a poet was one thing, but fathering a son who preferred burying his face in poetry books to hunting—well, that wasn't how Baba had envisioned it, I suppose. Real men didn't read poetry, and God forbid they should ever write it. Real men, real boys, played soccer just as Baba had when he had been young. Now that was something to be passionate about. In 1970, Baba took a break from the construction of the orphanage and flew to Tehran for a month to watch the World Cup games on television, since at the time Afghanistan didn't have TVs yet. He signed me up for soccer teams to stir the same passion in me, but I was pathetic. A blundering liability to my own team, always in the way of an opportune pass or unwittingly blocking an open lane. I shambled about the field on scraggy legs, squalled for passes that never came my way, and the harder I tried, waving my arms over my head frantically and screeching, "I'm open! I'm open!" the more I went ignored. But Baba wouldn't give up. When it became abundantly clear that I hadn't inherited a shred of his athletic talents, he settled for trying to turn me into a passionate spectator. Certainly, I could manage that, couldn't I? I faked interest for as long as possible. I cheered with him when Kabul's team scored against Kandahar, and yelped insults at the referee when he called a penalty against our team. But Baba sensed my lack of genuine interest and resigned himself to the bleak fact. That his son was never going to either play or watch soccer. I remember one time Baba took me to the yearly Buskashi tournament that took place on the first day of spring, New Year's Day. Buskashi was and still is Afghanistan's national pastime. A chapandaz, a highly skilled horseman usually patronised by rich aficionados, has to snatch a goat or cattle carcass from the midst of a melee. Carry that carcass with him around the stadium at full gallop, and drop it in a scoring circle, while a team of other chapandars chases him and does everything in its power—kick, claw, whip, punch—to snatch the carcass from him. That day, the crowd roared with excitement as the horsemen on the field bellowed their battle cries and jostled for the carcass in a cloud of dust. The earth trembled with the clatter of hoofs. We watched from the upper bleachers as riders pounded past us at full gallop, yipping and yelling, foam flying from their horses' mouths. At one point, Baba pointed to someone. Amir, do you see that man sitting up there with those other men around him? I did. That's Henry Kissinger. Oh, I said. I didn't know who Henry Kissinger was, and I might have asked. But at the moment, I watched with horror as one of the chapandars fell off his saddle and was trampled under a score of hoofs. His body was tossed and hurled in the stampede like a rag doll, finally rolling to a stop when the melee moved on. He twitched once and lay motionless, his legs bent at unnatural angles, a pool of his blood soaking through the sand. I began to cry. I cried all the way back home. I remember how Baba's hands clenched around the steering wheel, clenched and unclenched. Mostly, I will never forget Baba's valiant efforts to conceal the disgusted look on his face as he drove in silence. Later that night, I was passing my father's study when I overheard him speaking to Rahim Khan. 
I pressed my ear to the closed door. Grateful that he's healthy, Rahim Khan was saying. I know, I know. But he's always buried in those books or shuffling around the house like he's lost in some dream. And I wasn't like that. Baba sounded frustrated, almost angry. Rahim Khan laughed. Children aren't colouring books. You don't get to fill them with your favourite colours. I'm telling you, Baba said, I wasn't like that at all. And neither were any of the kids I grew up with. You know, sometimes you are the most self-centred man I know, Rahim Khan said. He was the one person I knew who could get away with saying something like that to Baba. It has nothing to do with that. Nay? Nay. Then what? I heard the leather of Bubba's seat creaking as he shifted on it. I closed my eyes, pressed my ear even harder against the door, wanting to hear, not wanting to hear. Sometimes I look out this window when I see him playing on the street with the neighborhood boys. I see how they push him around, take his toys from him, give him a shove here, a whack there, and you know, he never fights back. Never. He just drops his head and... So he's not violent, Rahim Khan said. That's not what I mean, Rahim, and you know it, Baba shot back. There is something missing in that boy. Yes, a mean streak. Self-defense has nothing to do with meanness. You know what always happens when the neighborhood boys tease him. Hassan steps in and fends them off. I've seen it with my own eyes. And when they come home, I say to him, How did Hassan get that scrape on his face? And he says, He fell down. I'm telling you, Rahim, there is something missing in that boy. You just need to let him find his way, Rahim Khan said. And where is he headed? Papa said. A boy who won't stand up for himself becomes a man who can't stand up to anything. As usual, you're oversimplifying. I don't think so. You're angry because you're afraid he'll never take over the business for you. Now who's oversimplifying? Baba said. Look, I know there's a fondness between you and him, and I'm happy about that. Envious, but happy. I mean that. He needs someone who understands him, because God knows I don't. But something about Amir troubles me in a way that I can't express. It's like... I could see him searching, reaching for the right words. He lowered his voice, but I heard him anyway. If I hadn't seen the doctor pull him out of my wife with my own eyes, I'd never believe he's my son. The next morning, as he was preparing my breakfast, Hassan asked if something was bothering me. I snapped at him, told him to mind his own business. Rahim Khan had been wrong about the mean streak thing. 